Welcome to this free immigration help channel. Today is March 20 and we are getting into the volume 35 of me answering all your immigration questions in the comments. Before I start, as always, I'm going to remind I'm not an immigration attorney. This is not a legal advice. All the information that I provide in these videos on this channel are directly from official government sources like USAS and the Department of State. So without further ado, let's start with the first comment from Giovanni Buller. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your names. My application for my son was approved. Congratulations. The priority date is May 2015. How much longer will he need to wait? So I have a follow-up question for you, uh, Joanny. I'm gonna I'm gonna post uh, this thing in here so that you're aware that I have uh, responded. Uh, but I need to know the category in which category your son is because there are two categories whenever it comes to visa bulletin and the availability of uh, the immigrant visas. Uh, there is F1 priority category and there is F3 priority category. The difference is the one is unmarried sons and daughters of U.S. citizens over 21 and the three is married sons and daughters of U.S. citizens over 21. And there is quite a dramatic difference between the two whenever it comes to the av availability of uh, immigrant visas. Now, because you said that your, uh, your son's priority date is May 2015, I am assuming that he is in, is in F3 category. Why? Because it is the F3 category that is still uh, being processed from way back November 2008, November 2009. So it's really, really behind. Uh, but it also might be in F1 category because it's right around, if it's F1 category, it's right around the corner that the immigrant visa is going to be available because as you can see, uh, for the dates of filing graph, it's from August, 2016. And then the final action dates are from the December, 2014 that are being processed, not processed, but the visas, the immigrant visas are becoming available as of right now, March 2023. This is the most recent visa bulletin that is available right now. And if you want to learn more about the visa bulletin, check out the video that I've done. Uh, it's called Understanding Visa Bulletin. Uh, there I go in a little bit more details what these graphs mean, what the different uh, categories and, and uh, different filing dates. Um, so if you need to learn more, you can check that video out. But if you can come back and uh, respond, not to this comment, but as a separate comment on, on uh, this video, uh, that would be really helpful and I could provide a little bit more information. This is volume 35. And uh, let's move on to the next one from Tarek. Tarek Rahman. Does a born citizen get more priority at USAS? Okay, so US citizens in general, yes, they do get somewhat a priority in USAS whenever it comes to certain petitions. Like, for example, petition for alien relative. Uh, but between the born U.S. citizen and naturalized U.S. citizen, there is really no difference. There is really no priority uh, that USAS uh, offers. Okay, moving further to the next uh, question from Waganza Lee. I'm a U.S. citizen. I want to sponsor my parents living outside the U.S. But 15 years ago, my parents overstayed at U.S. During the I-130 interview, will they be asked and can it be a problem? Okay, Vaganza, excellent question. Thank you for bringing this up. For whoever else is watching, I think it might be helpful. Now, whenever it comes to overstaying, definitely not a good thing. You definitely don't want to do that. Usually, if there is any kind of uh, any kind of ban or any kind of punishment that is involved for overstaying, a lot of times it's a 10-year ban. All right. It's, it doesn't mean that you cannot come back or that you cannot do anything about it. A lot of times there's just an inadmissibility waiver that you have to submit, but it is definitely additional questions. It is definitely additional headache. So in your case, Vaganza, I would definitely recommend reaching out to a family immigration attorney, going through a free consultation, find someone who provides free consultation and bringing up this issue because you have to be, they for sure 100% they have to be prepared, your parents, when they go for an interview, they have to be prepared to answer questions why they were overstayed. So they have to provide good explanation to why it happened. Uh, but you might want to be prepared just in case with an immigration attorney if the inadmissibility waiver needs to be filed. Again, usually it's 10 years since it's been 15 years ago, it might not be a problem. But the chances that they're going to be asked during the interview, this question 
are definitely very very high so i would recommend definitely getting prepared uh for these questions and having a good explanation and just in case having an immigration attorney on standby with the inadmissibility waiver all right let's move on to the next comment from da dravid chopra hi sir how are you sir i'm c your old vlogs thank you very much for watching i really appreciate it how's i am applying for a green card i'm staying in india uh so i'm assuming you're asking me the question how to apply for a green card whenever it comes to adjustment of status green card you do have to meet certain types of eligibility now there are there can be you know eligibility to for a green card through an immigration status like asylum refugee through a family immigration through employment so it's not just simply an application that you submit and then somebody determines whether you are you know you can well it is technically but you have to know your eligibility you have to be eligible uh, for that permanent resident status before you can actually apply for green card uh, but if you can provide a little bit more details if you have already any kind of eligibility let me know respond not to this comment but respond in this video as a separate comment um, and I will be uh, happy to address it uh, and whenever it comes to you know everyone who's watching please do not respond to my comments within your comments because for whatever reason I don't get the notifications on YouTube for these responses please submit a separate if you have a follow-up question or follow-up information please submit a separate comment um, in whatever video it doesn't really matter which one uh, and it will show up like this on my wall on in all, all of the comments okay let's move on to the uh, next question uh, which is not a question looks like it's two comments from Binyam Desta B1 B2 family sponsor visa so B1 B2 is actually uh, a non-immigrant um, visitor visa B1 is a uh, visitor for business uh, B2 is visitor for pleasure so it's not necessarily a family sponsor visa so Binyam, if you could clarify a little bit better, uh, I, I will type up the comment later asking you to clarify a little bit more if you have a question. Uh, but if you can, that would be great. All right, moving further, we got, oh, it looks like the same from Vaganza Lee, already answered. Um, so you guys don't have to actually uh, ask me multiple times the same question because once is knife. I, I don't miss them. They all come up on uh, this video. As long as it is posted as a separate comment, it will come up. I'm not going to miss it. All right, moving further to Francis Timba. Thank you so much for your valuable explanation. Thank you very much, Francis, for wa watching uh, and guidance on how to fill the form I-734. Okay, but I have a question on part one on page two. Okay, the space allotted for spouse name if married is just not sufficient to take in my spouse's name. Only her first name and the initial of her last name. Please advise what to do. This is on the petition form of my daughter. Okay, excellent question. Francis, because I can definitely relate. I have one of those long names and it was always a problem with these uh, immigration petitions and these applications and forms. Uh, so you have two options, all right, whenever it comes to that kind of stuff. Uh, one option is to not use you know the computer to type up the name just leave just for her just specifically for her name leave that field blank and once you print print out the form because you have to print it out regardless because you have to sign it just fill it up with uh try to kind of fit it uh by hand writing it down by hand and another option you can use the supplemental uh page that all the forms have the supplemental uh information page just you know put the where it is, which field it is. So you already know it's part one, page two, right? And then you select the unit, which unit it is. And then you just, because there's big fields in there, then you can fill up her name in there. So two options, whichever one you like more. All right, moving further to question from George. Enrique Vasquez, I don't see any information in regards to parents of US citizens and visa bulletin. George, actually that's good news that you don't see them there. It's really good. Why? Because it means that there is no visa cap whenever it comes to parents of US citizens. Yes, yeah, so as soon as the USAS petition is approved, petition on USAS side that is, approved, it's transferred to NVC. Once you're done with the NVC, once it is documentarily qualified, the visa is already available and the case is sent to the local U.S. Embassy for the parents to go for the interview. So it's good news for you, 
no waiting. Uh, well, there is still waiting. I mean, the processing time, a month there, a month, you know, here. But overall, it's, you know, compared to a lot of other uh, categories where people are sitting and waiting uh, for the immigrant visa to be available for their relatives, you don't have to do that in your case. All right, moving further to Claudio Pelicero. Hello, I'm filing in for my two kids to ask for the fee waiver of Form N-600. Okay. In the form is unclear if I have to act as the requester or if the requester section I have to put name and details of my kids. Thanks. Okay, Claudio, that is actually a really, really good question. I know the N N-600 is one of those weird forms because uh, it, it's designed for, uh, for children. Of U.S. citizens, basically, you're requesting a certificate of uh, of citizenship. That's really all it is, and it's for kids who are under 18. So it's like you already know that it's not the kid is going to be sitting there and typing up the form and reading the instructions. Even though, if you read the instructions, instructions are directed at this child who's filing this form, right? It's, it's weird. It's a little bit confusing, I know. So, but but in your case, because that application is going to be, uh, the main requester is going to be your kids, are going to be your kids, um, you will have to do the, uh, the fee waiver. It will have to be coming for whoever is filing the form N-600, and in your case, it's going to be your children. So it's definitely ho have to be... Uh, your your uh, coming from your children um, from their names um, and also I'm gonna remind that for each separate application you have to submit a separate fee waiver fee request form keep that in mind uh, all right I'm gonna do that I'm gonna move on to the next one from Nomad V thanks for making this content available you're very welcome thank you for watching it's super helpful I'm glad it is helpful. Sorry for the lengthy message, but the questions are direct. All right, let's do it. No need to apologize. All the questions are welcome, as many as you have. My girlfriend is from, I'm assuming GF is girlfriend, uh, is from Thailand and visiting on a B2 visa. She is currently visiting Florida. I'm in Indiana. She'll be in Florida for much of the remainder of her visa, end of May. She'd like to file an I-539, which is extension of stay or change of uh, status. And we've watched, non-immigrant status that is, and we've watched your video and read the instructions from USCIS carefully. Good. I have a few questions. I hope you can help. And there's read more. All right, rock and roll. Let's do it. I assume she should list her mailing address in Florida. So if approved, they will send a biometrics location near to where she's currently staying. Okay. Great uh, question number one. I think it's going to be helpful for everyone who's watching. So usually whenever it comes to scheduling the biometrics appointment, USAS, they schedule the biometrics appointment based on the physical address that is specified in the application. Now, because because there is such a drastic difference in this situation, her, her well, technically her physical address um, is somewhere. I'm assuming you saying your address in Indiana, her showing um, her physical address in Indiana, I'm assuming. So in this situation, I would definitely recommend if she's planning to go through the biometrics appointment in Florida, I would definitely recommend if she's comfortable getting the mail in Florida, it's much better to specify her physical address in Florida as well. First of all, it will prevent a lot of confusion in USAS because I've actually seen the cases where the physical address was in one state and the mailing address was in one state. The biometrics appointment in one case was scheduled where the physical address is and in another case it was scheduled where the mailing address is. And sometimes it happens, you definitely don't want to deal with that kind of situation. It's not the end of the world, it's really not a big deal. But instead of you know risking it, you can definitely prevent this. If she's in Florida, it means her physical address is also in Florida. If she can comfortably get mail in Florida, then she can comfortably specify the physical address also in Florida, especially if that's where she's planning to go for that biometrics appointment. All right, moving further to number two, if requesting an extended five or six months to visit additional friends and destinations, does the parting plane ticket need to be shown attached to the I-539 proof of departure? Okay, great question. So I'm assuming she already ha has um, a, a departure ticket uh, because I mean, if, if she's if she's visiting, 
on a non-immigrant status because think about it if you're requesting to change or extend the non-immigrant status it means that she's already here on non-immigrant status so whenever you're coming here on a non-immigrant visa then you have to have a round trip ticket basically um, so I'm assuming what you're saying you can basically extend that return flight um, and then show it as hey guys there we are planning to stay here she's planning to stay here for another five months and there you go I already have that returning uh, flight changed five months ahead okay with that being said now I would not recommend changing that flight until she actually gets the approval from the USCIS on that extension of stay uh, because you don't want to be in a situation where you change the flight and then for whatever reason whatever reason uh, most of the times there's really no problems you know it, it sounds like a legitimate uh, request for an extension of stay so there shouldn't be any problems but you definitely don't want to take that chance where you, you already make the plans and you already change the tickets and then for whatever reason this extension of stay is uh, denied or maybe it's just taking too long and then that's another thing another point that I wanted to mention uh, in answering your questions is that you don't want to be in a situation where you're waiting for that extension of stay and your current um, duration of stay her current duration of stay in this case is expiring you, you definitely don't want to risk it all right okay so let's move further if her so-called home address in Indiana but her mailing address is in Florida then I assume she should send this form to USCIS office related to her mailing address perhaps with the e-form this doesn't matter I don't know okay so yes definitely whenever it comes to physical address so if her physical address is in Indiana then she would have to send it to the service center um, that is related to Indiana however whenever it comes to the online applications if you're submitting the application online you don't have to worry about that at all because it automatically goes to the correct processing center so you don't have to worry about it at all but again with the address I'm gonna say you don't want to cause that confusion so I would highly recommend just physical address mailing address in the same state if not the same address at all okay number four her English is passable but I'm not sure USCIS would think so I don't know I plan on helping her with I-539 however I'm not a translator nor am I in Florida right now should I be considered an interpreter even though I don't know Thai as an example the section that explains why she is asking for additional time I will need to convert it from broken English to legible English does that make me an interpreter if she were called into the USCIS office alone it would be questionable as to whether she could handle it on her own if they ask her if someone helped me with the writing she could say yes does that mean I need to be listed on the form where is the line between interpreter and friend who is helping okay great uh, great question so whenever it comes to interpreter it is straightforward translator pretty much who is sitting there and interpret every single question and translates it you're not interpreter for sure so you don't have to worry about it now in some of the applications in some of the forms petitions they actually have a separate field for a preparer if that really kind of uh, if you really worried about that you can put yourself as a preparer although technically you're not the preparer either because the preparer is someone let's say I come to you and give you all my documents all my information and then you sit for me fill out this form based on everything that I provided so again you technically you're not the preparer either besides whenever it comes to the form I-539 there is really no interview nobody really going to ask her hey did somebody you know so don't worry about that you really don't have to put yourself as a, an interpreter or the preparer but if that really worries you that much if there is a field for a preparer definitely not the interpreter but the preparer if you want to you can but again really you don't have to you don't have to worry about that because again interpreter is someone who literally sits and interprets everything and then preparer is literally someone who prepares the form for someone and usually it's someone in the you know attorney's office like a paralegal or a legal secretary who does that for um, for the applicant uh, but in your case you really are just just helping uh, 
you know, kind of me like in these videos, you know, I'm not really a preparer or interpreter for anybody. I'm just, you know, kind of helping to fill out the form. Uh, okay, so moving further, five, question five, when filing the i 539 online, will they accept payment via credit card? Yes, yes they will, or will they still need a check money order? You can definitely submit a check, but you don't have to, it's much easier, much faster to just pay with a credit card, debit card, so yes, definitely. And if a check doesn't need to be from her US bank account or can it be from mine, what info about her case need to be on the check if CC is not accepted at time of duration? So I'm still gonna answer this question about the check just to make it, uh, you know, whoever's watching this video might be helpful for them. So whenever it comes to the check, yes, if you are filling out the online application, you can definitely send a check separately. I don't recommend doing that. Why? Because you're just delaying the submission of the application by you know couple of weeks now because you have to mail it you know it's in the mail for for a week and then it's in a p.o box or whatever on somebody's table for a week until it's actually processed all right credit card you pay it immediately instantly that's it the application is submitted so def definitely if there is an option to pay right there with the credit card debit card do that much better now whenever it comes to if you do have to send a check let's say you're sending uh, an application by mail it is definitely recommended to have the check be from the name of the applicant or the petitioner or someone at least who is on application i have seen cases where a check was submitted by someone who is um, not directly related on the application and it wasn't a problem USAS doesn't really care as long as it is paid as long as the check doesn't bounce or anything like this they really don't care uh, but uh, just a good recommendation have a check from the person who is directly involved with uh, with the uh, with the application and the very last one here what info about her case needs to be on the check it's really good in the memo to specify the name of the form so for example in this case if you're mailing uh, if you're mailing the application and you're writing the check in the memo on the check put the i539 that's really that would be helpful all right let's move on to the very last one the six when elaborating on her reason for extending her stay in the video you said one page do you mean that we should add an additional page after filing in the small paragraph box of section 8 okay so nomad because you're filing the application online then you really don't need to worry about the separate uh, whenever I talk about the separate one page I talk about the re really basically the cover letter and in the cover letter you're writing the explanation why you are requesting the that extension of of um, of stay in online you will already have a field where you can enter pretty much as much of the information as possible and you don't have to make it a cover letter style why because it is already part of the application package when you are sending stuff by mail you have to keep in mind that every separate page that is in the package has to have some kind of identifying information that it belongs to the application that is not something random all right just to make it easier for the immigration officer and to prevent possible mix-ups possible mistakes you definitely don't want it but with the online application you don't have to worry about it because it's already part of one application package so just write your explanation in the field where it is requested and that's really it that's really it so hopefully my answers were helpful if you have any follow-up questions don't hesitate to ask uh, just make sure not to respond to this comment make sure to submit a separate comment um, just so that I see it like this on the wall all right moving further to Ted Murray thank you for the information you're very welcome Ted thank you for watching uh, moving further fr from Kelly Moreno I need help we got a letter saying that I-589 couldn't be processed because our case was always executive judge okay so I-589 is uh, the application for asylum or withholding of removal uh, and that's a uh, that's an interesting situation so okay so I'm definitely gonna need a little bit more information on this um, how far are, are you in the process what process happened before um, beforehand before filing this because if if you have received this notice right it means that your case is already in immigration court it's not with USAS 
it is now with the immigration court. So you will have to be dealing with an immigration court. So, so right now, number one thing that I can advise you um, without really knowing any details is you definitely want to reach out to an immigration attorney. Definitely start shopping around for a good quality immigration attorney who specializes in asylum cases. And I have done a separate video on this channel where I talk about what qualities you are looking for in a good immigration attorney. Because I myself am an immigrant and I dealt with multiple immigration attorneys and I have been, I had great experience with immigration attorneys and I had absolute one of those horrible nightmare experiences with immigration attorneys. Um, so it's not just me, someone, I'm not biased, I'm not an immigration attorney myself, I'm not, you know, selling a service, you know, I don't ask you for any payments or anything like this. Uh, this is uh, this is more of someone coming from, you know, experience um, as an immigrant going through this process. Uh, so if you can provide a little bit more details, I'll try to address it a little bit better and give you more answers. But the only thing right now, you definitely need to start shopping for an immigration attorney. Since your case is already with the judge, is already with an immigration court, you definitely want um, um, a, a legal advice, a legal advice. Uh, so go for, I would recommend going, you know, for a few Try to find someone who offers free consultation. Just go three, four, five consultations and see, you know, different opinions, uh, different, you know, advices, and then you can compare the uh, what what they say. Because if it's with the immigration court, um, you definitely want to get an attorney involved. All right, moving further to a question from Fon Lionel. Thanks for the various responses you give to others. It really helps. You're very welcome, Fon. Thank you for watching. I have two questions to ask that you, with your experience, you can give some advice. All right, I'll try to do my best. I have a friend whose mother brought the grandmother to the US and she has a 10 years green card. But the grandmother has been in the US for over six years and she's not working. I mean, not working at all, but she's planning to file for her other children, the I-130. Is it possible for her to do the petition knowing well she's not being she's not been working for the period of time she has been in the USA? Any advice on this? Okay, great question, Fawn. Excellent question. Actually, you know, on this channel here and there, I do get similar questions about the taxes and all that sort of stuff. And you know, if you if you did a little bit of research on the petition for alien relative, you already know that you have to have some kind of financial backing because you serve, the petitioner also serves as a sponsor. In this case, yes, she can definitely file the petition, but right out from the, from the beginning, she will have to start looking for the sponsor. Another thing that she might, I mean, it might be an option, um, you know, if she's not working, it's not necessarily an indicator that she cannot be a sponsor herself because you know just because you don't work you know people who are retired they don't work but they might have some kind of assets they might have you know 401ks Roth IRAs whatever you know bank accounts where they can show that say hey look you know I have plenty of money I don't need to work and I want to sponsor my you know alien relative whoever the beneficiary is right in this case um, her kids so she could do that and if that's not an option, then as you file the application, obviously start looking for someone who is willing to be um, a joint sponsor on the application. That would be another option. All right, and question number two. If a person f file for someone and the petitioner pass away, what can be done on such a case since the petitioner is not there anymore to submit the affidavit? I will appreciate to get some response from the above two words. Thanks in advance. Okay, Fon, you're very welcome and thank you for asking. So to address your uh, concern number two is whenever it comes to the petitioner passing away, uh, most of the times if the petitioner passes away before the petition is approved by USCIS, a lot of times the petition is revoked. All right. And uh, unfortunately, there's really, there's not much you can do because, because you really do want to have the USAS approval. Uh, but if it is approved by USAS and the petitioner passes away, then you will have to find the substitute petitioner who will be willing to come up and basically um, fulfill um, the responsibilities of the 
original uh, petitioner, if that makes sense. Uh, so let me know if you have any follow-up questions. I will be happy to address them. I'm going to put the response here and then we're going to move on further. Probably one more question because we're getting close to the 30 minute mark. I'll probably have to do a volume 36 either today or tomorrow because I do have a lot of questions and I need to address them. The numbers of questions are growing and I'm trying to catch up. So if I'm taking a little bit too long to answer your question, I'm very sorry, but I definitely will. I definitely will address your question. Okay, the very last question for today is from Monica Pierre. Good night, June 19th, 2015 F1. It was approved. I'm not hearing anything on the case. Okay, Monica. Thank you for the question. Let me take a look. So we got the F1 priority, which is, uh, let's see, unmarried sons and daughters of US citizens, over 21, all right? F1, and let's see, we got June 19th, 2015, it was approved. So I'm assuming by USAS or maybe by the NBC, but let's take a look, 2015 we got, so right now it's August 16 for the dates of filing and December 14th for the final action dates. Now the difference between the two graphs is dates of filing is where the um, the petition was received by USCIS and the final action dates is when the petition was approved, documentarily qualified by the NVC. So, Monica, if you, uh, I mean, you can do, you can, you can kind of estimate for yourself, but if you want me to elaborate more, let me know if it was already documentarily qualified with the NVC or not, and I will elaborate more on this but regarding um, not regarding regardless sorry regardless whatever whichever it is you should be somewhere right around the corner I mean it's really it, it should be the visa becoming available anytime now it should be because this is really like in between the in between the two uh, priority dates that for, for both of the graphs, all right? So it should be any time now, but again, if you could come back and let me know uh, for sure whether it was documentarily qualified with NVC already or not, I would be able to provide more information on this. But again, for you, if it was documentarily qualified, then you're looking at these dates. If it wasn't and it was just received by USAS, you're looking at these dates. Honestly though, I'm thinking it most likely was already documentarily qualified why because it is so close to the immigrant visa becoming um, available so if it was received by USAS back in 2015 and right now they're pro processing August 2016 honestly you should have already heard something from them I would recommend submitting the NVC um, there is a they have an inquiry form it's an online inquiry form it's it's called uh, public inquiry form with the Department of State. If you Google that, public inquiry, uh, it's an online form that you fill out. You will have to put your case number, probably your invoice number as well. Put it just in case in the body, just so that they can locate it. And uh, yeah, just follow up on it and, and see what they, they say. Just, just to give them um, kind of a nudge, saying like, hey guys, you know, the immigrant visa should be already available. Uh, by now. So thank you very much everyone for watching uh, volume 35. If you have any questions, drop them in a separate comment uh, in the comments below or in whatever video. It really doesn't matter. I see them regardless and I will be happy to address them. And those whose comments I did not address yet, uh, please be patient. Uh, it's just one man show here. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to keep up. But uh, volume uh, 36 should be coming up either today or tomorrow. I'll try to do my best to address those questions as well. As always, thank you very much for watching everyone. God bless and I'll see you in the next video.